to those meetings on this afternoon. Our next Sabbath, we will continue with our communion service as we conclude a wonderful 40 days of prayer. Amen. And it's been a blessed time. We look forward to hearing your testimony and how God has blessed, restored, and brought about reconciliation in our lives as we conclude on next week's Sabbath. Next week's Sabbath. Uh, and so at this time, uh, I will ask that you will just prepare your hearts as we begin, as we well to start our worship service. God bless you, and may we all worship him in spirit and in truth.
Blessed Sabbath, everyone. I invite you to stand as we say our call to worship together. It's going to be found from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Uh, if it's on the screen, uh, you can read along with us from Revelation, chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. Uh, reading together, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. You have now been called to worship. Please remain standing. Good morning, everyone. Let us sing our intro. Remember the Sabbath. We set our work aside. We set our work aside. We leave our cares behind on this day of Sabbath. Rest. On this your holy day, we come to give you praise on this day of Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest, holy rest, on the day he set aside. Hello, blessed and sanctify, Sabbath rest, holy rest. Out of all the week, the best, we have come to be blessed on this day of Sabbath rest. Oh, how good, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. We praise God for the opportunity he has granted to us to be in his presence. It is a time for prayer. The word of God reminds us that bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits 
who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth all thy life from destructions, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfy thy mouth with goodness, so that thy youth is renewed as the eagle. The Lord exercises righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his way unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He will not deal, deal with us after our own sins. No reward is according to our iniquities. For as far as the heavens is from the earth, so is his mercy is toward his children. We are thankful for his mercy. This week God has been merciful to us, his children. There have been many within our nation who have suffered Death, turmoil, hardship, loss. And the list goes on and on. Even within our very midst, there are people who of which have come under the attack of the enemy. Death has come to their home. Sickness has come to their home. Families have been torn apart. And this morning, our merciful God says, come, cast our cares upon him, for he ever careth for us. We can thank God that he is our loving, merciful God. I invite you to bow your knees with us as we come before the Lord, casting all our cares upon him, for he careth for us. Our Heavenly Father, we come divinely before Thee in the name of Jesus, Thy darling Son. We praise You this morning for our great sacrifice, whom for the joy has despised the shame. We thank You, Father, that He was willing to go to Calvary for us, and during this season, while the world is reflecting upon your death, we say thank you, Lord. We don't just thank you for your death on Calvary's tree, but we thank you for your mediatorial work even now before the Father. We praise you that you were able to carry your own sacrifice into the Holy of the Holiest. And this morning, Lord, while you make intercession for us, we ask that you would have mercy upon us. You would forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You would create within us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us, O oh Lord. If we have done or said anything contrary to your will this week against our brothers, against our sisters, if we have stolen anything this morning, O oh Lord, or this week from Thee, we ask for forgiveness. If we have caused any division among the brethren, or even within the community, Lord, we ask for forgiveness. O oh Father, there are many this morning within our nation who are grieving. We think of the child's family, the loss of their loved one. Hobby Charles. We think of the Eastern family, Lord, the loss of Brother Elder Anthony Eastern. We think of the loss of the two men who were in the devastated accident on last Friday. Both died. Bless their family. Comfort them. We think this evening, this morning, Lord, of the family of the tourists from overseas. Bring comfort to them, O Lord. O De Lord, we think of the young men who, for whatever reason, Lord, was struck in his head. 
with a blow, succumb to his death. Oh Lord, be with the family. Be with the family of the young baby, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you'll be with our immediate congregation, those who are sick, those who have relationship with the families we have just mentioned, and of those of which we have not mentioned. Bring comfort to them. Bring healing to them. Bring revival to this church and to thy people. Now, Father, we ask for your blessings upon the leaders of our government. Grant to them wisdom. Bless our premier and our governor. We ask blessings upon all of our legislative bodies. You would bless our commission of police, of prison, leaders of the city. Remember all divisions of this country. To this day, Lord, we say thank you. Now bless our administrative team at the Bermuda Conference. May your name be glorified in their lives. May the work of the transforming work of the gospel, of this everlasting gospel, go forth with such vigor and such power. Now, Lord, bless the speaker this morning. May your name be glorified in and through her. Circumvent and protect her family. Bless the ministries of which she's currently involved with and those of which she shall be involved with in the days to come. Bless the waiting congregation, we pray, and save us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we all stand for our opening song, which is Joy to the World? This song was chosen by our speaker, and we want you to pay attention to the words not think about the time you normally sing it. So let's pay attention to the words this morning. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let her free see her king. Let every And heaven and nature see, and heaven and nature see. Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. Let men the Repeat the sound in joy, repeat the sound in joy, repeat the sound in joy. No, no more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns in Far as the, as the curse is far, far as the curse is far, far as the curse is far. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the name Shuns the glories of his righteousness 
and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders of his love this is it Welcome and happy Sabbath, one and all. We are the Williams family. My name is Wayne Williams, and this is my wife, Paula Williams. We represent the health ministry team who, along with the Family Life Department, organized this week events with Dr. Barbara O'Neill from Sickness to Health. The word welcome is a kind greeting. It emphasizes your arrival gives pleasure and is one of the most universal terms used in the hospitality industry, offering kindness to guests. To our guests and regular members, we welcome you and invite the Holy Spirit's presence. Shall we, Shall we sing, sing together the, the song, song Smile? Smile? Let us greet somebody, somebody in Jesus' Jesus name. name. Let us tell them that we love them in Jesus' name. Tell them we come to work together in Jesus' name. Now all you seasoned members should know this song. All you new ones, pay attention and learn a new song. Learn a new song. And greet each other as you're singing. Let us greet somebody in Jesus' name. Let them take their love to them in Jesus' name. Tell them we can work together in Jesus' name. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Let's bless somebody in Jesus' name. Let us take them to work together in Jesus' name. Work together in Jesus' name. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Everybody smile. Jesus loves you. Smile, Jesus loves you. Everybody smile, Jesus loves you. Welcome, Welcome everyone. One. Your, Your arrival, arrival gives, gives pleasure. All right, blessings again. Uh, we're now moving on to our children's story. After the children's story, we're going to have uh, children's offering and then the children's scripture, which will be uh, led by Elder Leonard Gibbons, who's also the director of the health department for the Bermuda Conference. Uh, the offering that will come up after the children's scripture is to assist in helping the children feeding program in the Western District of the public schools. Uh, partial of the funds will go towards this proceedings. I'm just going to pray, and then we'll bring up our children's scripture by Sean Lay Smith, followed immediately uh, by the children's offering, and then the children's story. So, dear Heavenly Father, we pray and ask that you will bless uh, the offering as it's taken up for the children's feeding program as part of the funds. Or to that, we pray that you will bless uh, not only the, the proceeds to help with their physical, uh, uh, physical needs, but also the spiritual needs. So, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Right up there. 
Praise the Lord. Morning, church. Our scripture reading will be taken from 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Have a happy Sabbath. Good morning, boys and girls and big boys and girls. Okay, we have a really interesting story today, and we'll see if it really works out. The way I want to work out, I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? Um, okay. All right, what do I have here? You got to respond, right? Tell me what you see, okay? Is it all right? What's this? Chocolate, right? Okay, it's called Bounty, right? What, what do I have here? m and ms Anybody like m and ms All right. M&M. Anybody like Bounty? Oh, what about these gummy-like sort of... Anybody? Yeah? Looks like something you like. Okay. Now, all of these three... I guess you call them foods. They fall in one type of food. And what is that type of food called? Chocolates. Uh, give me another word. It begins with S. Sugar. Sweets, right? All right? Okay, now I got something else. And look at this. What's in this? What do you see? Fruit? What type of fruit? Apples. Grapes, banana, and what's this here? Orange, tangerine, right? Now, are these sweet? Yeah. Are these sweet? Yeah. Both are sweet. Okay, who made these? Ah, who made this? Ah, you know our speaker goes, huh? You ever heard that? So man made these, God made these. Now I got something else here, and I couldn't get what I really wanted. So 
This was a substitute. What is this supposed to be? Sugar. sugar. No, any of you that ever had sugar cane? Okay, now there's one thing about sugar cane. You know, it's really hard to get to the sugar. Man, you got to strip this thing, you got to, and then you got to chew it. And I, I know I have never chewed this amount of sugar cane at one time. It's so hard to get to, right? Now, this is real easy to get to, right? You just open it and plop it in your mouth, right? But this here, you have to work real hard. Now, who made, who made this? Okay. Tell me, I want one of you to tell me, why is it that it's so hard to get to the sugar in the sugar cane? Why did God make it so hard? Yes. Maybe it's because it's better if you work for it. It's better if you work for it. Okay, all right. Anybody got any other ideas? It's better if you work for it. But if you had this amount, by the time you chewed through this here, you know what you would feel like? What's the average person feel? I'm tired. I can't eat anymore, right? I've been chewing and chewing, and you won't eat anymore, right? Now, isn't that amazing that God, even though it's sweet, Right? He put it in something so hard to get to, right? So that it would take what? So you won't have too much of it. Well, you know what man did? Man took the long sugar cane and they processed it. And you know what they did? I'm going, we're going to figure out how much sugar cane you would take to eat this one bar. Right? Okay, I'm going to need somebody to help me with this. Okay, ah, yeah. that was so fast. All right, so I need, okay, we're going to figure this out, right? Who, who wants to help? Okay, let, let's take the young lady who's right in front of us. Okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to hold on to this here. Okay, let's see. Take that. Okay, I want you to keep walking. All right, keep going. Now, this is feed of sugar cane that you're going to need to eat to get that one bar. Now, I need to get through that way there. If you could just move over just a little bit. Okay, let's see. Whoops. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. All right, 21 feet of sugar cane to eat that one little bar. Anybody here gonna eat 21 feet of sugar cane? <laughs> Oops. Anybody? Oops. Nobody's gonna be able to do that, right? And God protected us from too much sugar by putting it in this very hard outer shell. Now, what happens when we do eat that amount? Well, when I was young, like a lot of you, I did an experiment, and I went to the, to the pet store, and I bought two of these. Okay, look, they look really nice little, oh, little chicks, yeah? And I liked to experiment when I was young. So I built this cage. And on one side of the cage, I put one chick. And the other side, I put the other chick. And one, I gave them water. Who wants to hold my mic? For? So I put my tears to my mouth. OK. So I gave them water. And what is this? Okay, I gave them oats and whole grains and all those sorts of things. And the other chick, well, I took some, what's this? All right, and I put some, some water to that. In fact, I bought this stuff they call, um, what's, that, what's that red punch, right? Fruit punch, right? Fruit punch, right? 
I mixed it all up, right? And I gave them sweets. I gave them white bread, sugar, and all of that. And then I just watched. And the weeks went by. And after a few weeks, guess what? There was a big difference between the chick that had the whole grains and the water and the chicks that had all the sugar-sweetened things. And anybody want to guess what was the difference? Yes. Yes. He got sick. was healthy. Okay, one was healthy and one was sick. Any, any other thoughts? Well, guess what? I came to the cage, right? And one cage was dirty. And when I came by the cage, the, the chick was flying all over the place like he had lost his mind. <laughs> the whole place was dirty and everything was all over the place. I went to the cage where the chick was drinking water and eating the whole grain. He was just chirp, chirp, chirp. I put my hand in. You know what he did? He climbed on my hand. The other one flew away from me like I was doing something bad to him. <laughs> I was. I was. Now, so... What's the object lesson of this story? When we take something that God gives us just in the right amount and we do a whole lot to it, it does something to us. You know, it's hard to get to the sugar cane, but how hard is it to get to the grape? Not hard at all, right? I can open this and eat this freely, but this air, I have to work hard. So God puts things in hard packages that we shouldn't have too much of. And the things that we should have more of, he makes it so easy that we can get it. So I want to encourage you to eat more of what God made, right? And this stuff here, stay away from it, right? It's inspired by someone else, and it's not God. Who wants to pray for us? that God will give us the courage to make the right choices and to ask for fruit and not for this stuff here, okay? Now, you see, Satan did something really special because the brains of the young kids, they're more sensitive to sugar than, than adults. And the companies are all designed to get them hooked when they're young and keep them for life. But let us not let that happen, right? Don't reward kids with this stuff. You're not showing them that you love them. You're actually setting them up for a life of misery and pain and death. Okay? Who's going to pray? Okay. I'll pray. Malaysia? We do. Oh. Dear God. Thank you, Lord, for Sabbath day and help those who are sick and help them to be healthy, Lord. And help us be healthy, Lord, and be those who are poor, Lord. And help them, Lord, to be happy, Lord. And, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go quietly back to your seats.
Amen, amen. As we transition to us in our service, we're getting ready to transition into what we call the tithe and the free will offering. And I'd just like to remind our members, the disciples and guests, at the end of the service, we'll be lifting up an offering, which will go to the local conference development. So just you know, feel free to um, give uh, additional offering if you can at the end of the service. At this time, I'd like to read a scripture to you. And this one's taken from Proverbs chapter 3. And I read from verses 5 to 10. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thy heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and morrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and the presses shall burst out with new wine. So at this time, I'd like to encourage you, give what you can in the tithe and free will offering. I'd like to share with you a brief testimony just to show you how when you trust God, how he fills your bonds. He may fill it directly or indirectly. I had an experience as I do my errands in town, and I had the opportunity of, um, I guess, running to a gentleman that was asking for funds. And this is what I said to him. I said, um... I have some bills to pay, because, you know, for those that are on a tight budget, everything's accounted for. So I said, I, I have some bills to pay, and if I have some change left in my pocket, I will give it to you when I come back. And I didn't know God was listening, you know, that, you know sometimes we, we say things and God's recording. So I go, to the, I go to the businesses to pay my bills, and what do you think happened? The bills were paid. So what was in my pocket <laughs> was the change I had to give him. <laughs> so I'm just letting you know, when we trust Lord, the Lord, he works it out in different ways. He may increase your account directly in the bank, but he may increase it differently. And so I had to be, I guess, one, one, as a Christian, I had to also, I have to be honest. So when I went back, I gave him what I had in my pocket. So it made his day, and I, and I thank God he, he took care of me. And so I'm sure that just to let you know that no matter what you're able to give, even if it's your last, God will take care of you. And so at this time, I'd like to just have a prayer, a word of prayer, and then we have the, the deacons and the ushers to come forward to lift the tide and free we off. And thank you. Our Father, once again, in the precious of your Son, Jesus Christ, we thank you for your love, mercy, and grace you showed to, towards us, Lord God. And we thank you even for blessing us, Lord God, when we trust you. And as we lift this tide and free will I ask, may you bless each and every one in the hearing of my voice as you take these funds and, and use it for your service and ministry, Lord God. And I pray once again, we just ask, may you bless this church family, bless our members and disciples and visitors alike. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
and church family. This week has been an awesome week, amen? A beneficial week to many, whether here in person, and as I heard, even those, many of those online. And so on behalf of the church and the board, and on behalf of our week's visitors, I I stand here to thank the Southampton Church Health Department team and the Family Life team uh, for organizing such a wonderful weekend. Amen? Amen. I invite uh, our health uh, ministry department leader, uh, Dr. Pastor, sorry, Brother Wayne, Brother Wayne Williams and wife uh, to the front at this time. I'm also going to ask if Elder Damian Ray who serves as the Family Life Director for Southampton Church to join me at the front at this time. And then, of course, Sister Renee Pierman to join me at the front at this time, representing the Health Department. I'm also going to ask that you would uh, escort Dr. Barbara O'Neill uh, to the front at this time. Elder Ray, thank you. Dr. O'Neill, uh, this week we benefited greatly by your passion for good health and natural healing. This week we learned by God through you about giving the body optimum conditions in order for it to heal itself. As a result, we have a better understanding of how the body works and that this body is truly the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your presentations were clear engaging, uplifting, and filled with hope. As a gospel minister, I, and I'm sure many others, were attracted by your presentations, especially because of these hopeful words you encouraged us with. And I quote, a merciful and forgiving God has given us a merciful and forgiving body. Some of us, we can press the reset button after these meetings. We have been greatly blessed by Dr. O'Neill's ministry here in Bermuda. And so it is with great appreciation we present to you, as you depart today, a special gift from the Southampton Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so on behalf of the church family, we want to thank you for all that you have done for us here in Bermuda. And I think not just at Southampton Church, but also all of our guests and visitors. If you want to show your appreciation to Dr. O'Neill, why don't you give her a warm Bermuda welcome? So we're glad for the presentations. Uh, Dr. Menders, our conference president, uh, was inspired, especially by the message last night, and he has made sure that it does not end here, everyone. But we look forward to what God's going to do here in the Bermuda Conference in the future. We thank you. <laughs> After the uh, family choir sings this special selection, God will bless us to hear one more time Dr. Barbara O'Neill. Amen. Amen.
bush cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Neither can you Thank you, everyone. I must say it's been a pleasure being here in Bermuda, and it, was, it is with great joy that I would like to return. <laughs> if you will have me. It's a very beautiful island, and I have certainly uh, uh, grown to love the island and certainly you are a very warm people so thank you for making it so um, enjoyable for me. I'm going to be talking today about again the brain. In our first lecture this morning we looked at the many things that are starting to take the brain down, are starting to interfere with the part of our brain where God communicates with God. And you can see that the enemy of soul, he is doing it so much through, de through deception. In, in Proverbs 14, verse 6, the Bible says, A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy to him that understands. My aim is to give you an understanding of the body, and particularly today, of the human brain. 
And when you have an understanding of it, now you have the knowledge on how to treat it. I want to begin by a paragraph from a book called Education, page 100, where it says the same power that upholds nature is working also in man. The same great laws that guide alike Star and Adam control human life. The laws that govern the action of the heart, regulating the current of flow to the body, are the laws of the mighty intelligence that has jurisdiction of the soul. From him all life proceeds. Only in harmony with him can be found its true sphere of action. To all objects of his creation, the conditions are the same. A life exercised in harmony with the creator's will. A life sustained by receiving life from the creator. Notice this last sentence. To transgress his law, whether it be physical or mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy and ruin. You can see why I memorised that section. So beautifully rare, written. But look at those three laws. When I first read this, I thought... I know the physical laws, we've been looking at physical laws all week. The moral law, the dictionary calls the Ten Commandments, the great moral code of ethics. But what are the mental laws? I had never heard of mental laws. So I went on a journey of discovery with my mental law glasses on. And I discovered that there are seven mental laws. And as my framework in this lecture, I would like to use those seven mental laws. The first law must always be Newton's third law of motion. To every action, there is an equal and an opposite reaction. It is the law of cause and effect. And never should the effect be blamed as the cause. And how often is it? Yeah. A lady said, I found the cause of all my problems. I've got chronic fatigue syndrome. That, that's not the cause, that's the effect. <laughs> the effect of chronic fatigue syndrome is lack of oxygen at the cellular level. Because every cell that has oxygen gives 18 times more energy. Now there may be a hundred causes for lack of oxygen. I've had people come to me and say, I found the cause of all my problems. I've just discovered I've got depression. Uh, no, no, that's not the cause, that's the effect. Panic attacks. I have found people today, more and more, are getting panic attacks. A lady emailed me recently. She said, my mother was taken to hospital with panic attacks. She was there for two days. She got home. An hour later, she's back at the hospital. Panic attack. I want to show you what happens in a panic. Let me tell you a story about a lady and let's draw our nerve cell because I want to show you what's happening in the nerve cell when someone has a panic attack. So here's your nerve cell. Here's the axon coming out. Sorry. They're the dendrites. They're the receiving stations. This is the axon. The message is coming out. And here are the little filaments at the end, the little boutons. And here is the next nerve cell. And here are the receiving stations for that nerve cell. And I'm going to tell you the story about a lady who was at work one day and she noticed over the weeks that one of the workers was changing the figures in the books. So she told the boss. That night she got a brick through her front window. Is, is that a time to panic? Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. I'd panic. See, in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for every season under, under heaven. There's a time to panic, and there's a time not to panic. We've got, we've got to decipher this. And let me show you what happened to this girl, because it became very grey. So she panicked that night. Now, when that brick went through her front window, it made a strong pathway in her brain. This is a physical pathway. It had a profound effect on her. No wonder. It would have a profound effect on me. And next time she had something stressful happened, her emotions went down that pathway. It's like the pathway in the bush. Yesterday I went to one of the coves and I looked down at the beach and I thought, how can I get down there? 
looks very cliffy. And I looked over and I saw a path. Praise God. It was a well-worn path. And it was a lot easier to go down the well-worn path <laughs> than other ways. Do you know, these paths are in our brain. So every time she had something stressful happened, what's happening to her? She's going down that pathway. And it got to the point where she was panicking about everything. So she went to the doctor. He said, I think I've found the cause of all your problems. You get panic attacks. What did that do to the pathway? Just put a little bit of Rio in there. He made another pathway. He said, you'll be on panic attack medication for the rest of your life. She went home. Her mother said, what did he say? He said, I get panic attacks. Whoop, a little bit more. He said, I'll be on medication for the rest of my life. Can you see what's happening? The more you frequent those pathways, the stronger they get. It's just like exercise. So the question is, what pathways are you strengthening? That's the challenge for each one of us. And as we go through this lecture, I imagine that little voice will be in your brain. Where are your pathways? Science now shows us that we can be rewiring our brain right up until the day we die. Isn't God good? And he talks about rewiring the brain. In fact, in Ezekiel 36, verse 26, the Bible says, I will take away your heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Do you know, before the age of 25, I lived a certain way and then God touched me on the shoulder. He appealed to my frontal lobe. This morning we talked about the frontal lobe. Here's our brain in a very simplistic way. The front part of the brain is where the frontal lobe is. And the front part of the brain is where God communicates with man. And it's in the front part of the brain where our reasoning powers reside, where our judgment takes place, where our intellect is. Do you know, God made us intelligent beings. And in the front part of the brain is where our decision is, the will. The will is the governing power in the nature of man. It is the power of decision or of choice. So when God tapped me on the shoulder, what he showed me made sense and I made a decision. And I'm so glad he took away that stony heart and gave me a heart of flesh. He rewired my brain. God can do it. He speaks about it. So this girl was having panic attacks and the doctor had just said, you get panic attacks. About a year later, she couldn't even drive the car. She was feeding these pathways, didn't even realise what was happening to her. She came to our health retreat. She told me her story. I said to her, aha. Uh -huh. I said, I think you're panicking about your panic attack. She smiled. What did the smile say? I know, but I don't know what else to do. I made another pathway. I said, I believe that you will be able to overcome your panic attacks. What did I do when I said that? I made another pathway. But how big's the pathway now? Not very big. I said to her, I believe that eventually you'll be able to come off your medication. She went home very happy. Her mother said, what happened? Oh, oh, the health doctor said I can overcome my panic attacks. The health doctor believes that eventually, can you see what's happening? The more you go that pathway. But I knew that she needed help. So I gave her a prescription. What to do when the lightning strikes? I don't like the name panic attack. Almost makes you panic. The first thing she had to do was laugh. <laughs> she said, I will not feel like laughing. I said, that's right. You won't, but you will. What did I say when I said that? I made a pathway. What was the pathway? You'll be able to laugh. Yeah. It's as simple as this. If you say you can, you will. And if you say you can't, you're right. <laughs> you see, the back part of our brain is the feeling part of our brain. And the feeling part of our brain is a bad boss. 
Feelings aren't bad, they just make a bad boss because they go up and down like the wind, whereas the front part of our brain is a very good boss. Because every decision that this boss makes is made according to reason, intellect and judgment. Do you see that? So when I said to her, you're right, you won't be able to laugh, you see that, acknowledge. And practice smiling, everyone. You can get away with so much if you smile. My husband taught me. I used to watch him. He's, he speaks straight. He says it like it is. And sometimes when he speaks straight, he speaks it with a smile. <laughs> That's very powerful. Practice it with your children. <sighs> Mom, I want that. What is it? Bounty? <laughs> no. You see that? <laughs> Do you know when you smile, you're telling them you love them? I love you too much, my sweetheart. But you can have this or this, you see that? I used to always give my children a choice. You know what the choice was? You can have an apple or an orange. <laughs> you see that? But there are some choices I wouldn't give them. Uh huh. You see, the frontal lobe is fully developed at the age of 30. That's why your children need you. <laughs> so let's go back to the girl who had panic attacks. I said to her, when you get a panic attack, come laugh. What does Proverbs 22, is it seven, or 17, 22 say? A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. Hey? What's the old saying? If we weren't laughing, we'd be crying. Laugh. So when I was at St. George's at the port, fort, looking down, oh, I had to get a clip of this, and my phone slipped out of my hand. And it went down on that cement, and it went over the edge, and I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and my guide didn't. <laughs> he went, oh, no. I said, it's all right. It's all right. Hey, it's all right. Anyway, we went running over to a man. It's gone over on the cliff, down the cliff. He said, oh. He said, if it's high tide, you won't get it, but if it's low tide, you might. Walk around. So we ran down, and my guide said, I'll go. And I looked at his fancy leather shoes, and I looked at my joggers. I said, I'll do it. I don't mind, because you had to walk through a bit of water. He was very worried. I said to him, I can tell you right now, my life is not worth that phone, so I'm not going to take any risks. Right? And he let me go. Anyway, I clambered through and up and down, and I'm all right, I'm a bushy. Do you call it a bushy? <laughs> Joggers got a bit wet, that was all right. And I turned the corner and I saw the big cannon, which is about where I was. I thought, whoa, there's lots of waves there. On I go. I looked down and there was the phone. Not in the water, hardly a scratch. Praise be to God. I knew I had to get back as soon as I could because my guide was worried. <laughs> I was out of sight. So I ran back, had the phone, and whew, I could see. Do you know I believe that when we say, thank you, Father, when we smile, do you know I believe it opens God's hands? I was telling someone that night on this phone and they can hardly see a scratch on it. And I opened it up and, you know, the whole thing was videoed. <laughs> <laughs> I must have just pressed video to get this beautiful... Oh, and away it went. <laughs> God is so good. <laughs> and we all know Romans 8.28 that God can turn all things out together for good for those that love him, for those who are called according to his purpose. So I said to this lady, laugh. She said, I won't feel like laughing. I said, you'll be able to laugh. In Australia, we've got a kookaburra. Have you heard of the kookaburra? It goes, I'm not allowed to do that call in front of my children. <laughs> Very embarrassing, they say. I said, just pretend to be the kookaburra. Just go, ha, 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 ha. And as you're going, ha, 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 it's a choice. It's a choice. Did you know that happiness is a choice? Yes. Did you know we have no, no right not to be happy? Huh? It's a choice. We're not in concentration camps. Huh? 
So I said, laugh. And as you're laughing, ho, 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 get crystal of Celtic salt, have a glass of water. Your brain's a hydroelectric system. Put the kettle on, get some chamomile tea. Remember what she's doing here? She's overcoming that panic attack. Now her whole body will be screaming at her, panic. That's the feeling, bad boss. Hmm? Can see what she's doing? She's totally ignoring it. It's screaming at her. Her nerves are on edge. She's just ignoring it. Not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. But anything we do in life that takes effort, is it easy? I look at that pianist and I know that he didn't start playing that piano yesterday. And that took a lot of effort. Because he doesn't seem to have any music in front of him. <laughs> But you know what I know, that's a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. Anything we put work into in life, okay, the more we put into it, the more we get out. That's why you've got to address what are you putting your time into. So this lady, she's putting all her time into conquering this panic attack. She's only 30. I don't know anyone who wants to be on that medication for the rest of their life. I said, just laugh, ho, 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 take your water, ho, 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 ho. Outside, take some deep breaths. Oxygen soothes the nerves. Run around the house three times if you've got to. Really struggling, have a cold shower. Dive in that ocean, that'll, whew. <laughs> can you see how the physical things can help you get you through that peak? I gave birth to six babies. I went through childbirth six times. You go through a peak, you think you can't hold on, and ha, ah, then it eases. <laughs> Three minutes later, another one comes. <laughs> but frontal lobe is where your foresight is. Uh -huh. You're looking ahead. Women go through the hard work of labor because out of that is the incredible privilege of giving birth to a new baby. And I had the incredible privilege when my fifth child, when they thought I had ages to go and no one was around, he came. And I delivered my baby myself. Oh, do you know what an incredible privilege to actually take out of your own body a new little one. Incredible. I feel sorry for you guys. That you, can't. <laughs> you can't be part of it because it is, it is a miracle. So that gets, the, that, that gets the lady through. Every now, now and then a husband has to remind her what's at the end of this thing. <laughs> it's hard. And that woman's body was screaming at her to panic. But she resisted. Mm -hmm. No, I want to conquer this thing. And when she got through her first panic attack, how did she feel? Like a mighty conqueror. Yes. But what's still the biggest pathway? Can you see that? And every time she conquers that panic attack, every time she reminds herself, I'm conquering this, I'm conquering this, and she doesn't go down the panic attack pathway, what's happening to the old pathways? They're fading. How long does it take? 21 days. 21 days of going down the new pathway and 21 days of not going down the old pathway, that lady rewired her brain. Praise be to God. The science is showing this can happen right up until the day you die. You know the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Wrong! You can! <laughs> you can. You can. <laughs> Keep saying it. Repetition deepens the impression. And repetition is the mother of retention. A man, a guest, said to me, oh, no, it's 60 days now. I said, 60? 60? That's if you're dehydrated. That's if you're having late nights. That's if you're not exercising. Huh? That's if you're not eating nourishing food. That's not if you're not getting your fresh air and your sunshine. Can you see that? So when he told me 60, that threw me, and then I thought, no, 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 no. There's got to be a reason. Where's my why? There is always a reason. I have seen many people conquer their panic attacks by those simple measures. It's not easy. Depression. Depression is not a cause. Depression is an effect. So what's my next question? 
What causes depression? Too many highs. What causes a high? We looked at this this morning. Sugar causes a high. And I thank the good doctor for that excellent presentation. You'll think twice now, hey? <laughs> Hybridise wheat. We've looked at this through the week. Caffeine. They call it Australia's darling. What's a darling? Something they love. Alcohol. Alcohol, tobacco. Also drugs, especially the mind-altering drugs. Mm -hmm. These are causing highs. That's why people do it. It gives that lift, that high. But you know, they all come with corresponding lows, and those highs are transitory. Do you know what that means? Don't last. They don't last. And then you've got the corresponding low. And you know the low, it lasts. It lasts. So your highs and your lows, which cause the chemical imbalance in the brain, are by these very socially acceptable things. We're also looking at the chemical imbalance from the lack, lack of oxygen. I met two guys, guess, in the last 18 months who got depression, 18 months after moving into a mouldy house. Now what we've looked at this week, which each nerve cell, each nerve cell has energy cycles in it, and if oxygen's present, 18 times more energy. So when someone's in a mouldy house, they're getting two units of energy in their brains instead of 36. How do they start thinking? Their thinking becomes warped. Do you know the Bible says if the house is mouldy, have you read what it says to do? Destroy it. Lack of oxygen can be because of lack of exercise. What we also looked at, especially last night, that muscle knows no age. Whether you're 9 or 90, you should be fit. Hmm? Have a look at the exercise program the Olympi Olympian athletes go through. Have you looked at it? Whew. And we're training for something more important than the Olympic Games. Hmm? We're training for life. We're training for God's service. We're in primary school now. We're heading for high school. Yeah? Are you prepared? In fact, I think some of the saints' bodies are so deteriorated they won't, they don't want, they don't, what, they won't know what to do with that new body. <laughs> Lack of water can cause depression because our brain is a hydroelectricity, no hydro, no electricity. We've looked at the importance of drinking water little by little through the day so you can get a lot in. Lack of sunshine. When the sunshine goes through neurochemical pathways into our brain, it stimulates the pineal gland to release serotonin, and serotonin is the hormone that makes you feel good. Lack of sleep can cause depression. You see, sunshine and sleep both are causing a release of that, but that serotonin is only released between the hours of 10 and 3. So make sure, if you're not sleeping, make sure the light's out, you're relaxed, and you're thanking God so much that you're in a comfortable bed. Even though you're not sound asleep, you are still getting some of those hormones. Lack of fat. The brain is the fattiest organ in the body. This misconception that fat is bad is shocking because the brain can't function without it. The two fats that the brain loves is omega-3, there's your flax, your chia, your walnut, and it loves saturated fat as fuel, and the best saturated fat is your coconut. There are whole books written how coconut can heal damage in the brains by Dr. Bruce Fife. Amazing. Lack of vitamins. Vitamin B particularly, and vitamin B3. 1% of doctors today are using ment are, are treating mental are treating mental illnesses with nutrition and they're using vitamin B3 that's uh, nicotinic acid and some doctors are using up to 10,000 milligrams of nicotinic acid that's not forever this is just until we control the situation lack of lack of minerals and your island is surrounded by the best minerals in that seawater, but you don't have to drink it. 
Just put a little bit in your cooking. One cup equals one teaspoon of salt. Greens, dark green leafy vegetables, your calcium and your magnesium particularly are used by the brain. And caffeine leaches the calcium and magnesium. Sugar leaches the calcium and magnesium. Do you know the devil takes minds down through deception? Isn't that right? Lack of progesterone. Last night we looked at the hormones. And the contraceptive pill, chemicals, plastics are displacing progesterone. It's called the happy hormone. We're looking at what causes the chemical imbalance. Excess, excess pain is debilitating. If someone's in pain, you've got to find out why. Do a hydrotherapy treatment, maybe a poultice, maybe a chiropractic adjustment. You've got to find out why the pain is there. Excess food. You know, poor old stomachs are having too much food put in or they're having them food put in all day long. And we're not cows, we've got five stomachs, we've got one. <laughs> huh? Put the food in and leave it alone. <laughs> It'll take about three and a half to four hours to digest. What about the children? They've got the same stomach. And you know, children will say they're hungry when they're bored. You've probably worked that one out. Give them a glass of water, they won't die. <laughs> And remember to smile when you give it to them. <laughs> Excess stimulation. This is taking brains down because when brains are overstimulated and the stimulated stops, what's happened? The brain goes down. So be very careful on exposure to technology where the most stimulation's coming from. You don't get overstimulated by sitting on that cliff there and watching those beautiful waves and the birds. It's the technology. The brain can be poisoned. So what poisons the brain? Your alcohol poisons the brain. Heavy metals poison the brain, like mercury. Also lead, all your heavy metals, chemicals poison the brain. Something else poisons the brain which might surprise you, but it might not, and that is negativity. When you memorize the verse, in everything give thanks, that, that, that dispels all negativity. Is that right? Thank you for my broken leg. Well, you don't like it, but you know when you say thank you, you're saying, I believe that out of this, wonderful things will happen. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she's a, she's a woman, a doctor, who's written many books on the brain. She's got a book called Who Switched Off My Brain? And she shows that when we entertain or cherish negativity, thorns grow between the dendrites. Ellen White says in um, the book Ministry of Healing, excellent book, and the chapter Mind Cure, she says grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all break down the life forces and can tend to invite decay and death. Who would invite decay and death? And yet when we hold on to negativity, cherish, entertain, hold on to it, thorns are made. See, when a negative thought comes in, it wafts through our dendrites. It's like a tree, and they're the branches of the tree. So this negative thought comes in, and we have a point. At that point, we have a choice. Will we keep it or let it go? Mm-hmm. Will we keep it or let it go? So I had a choice when my phone dropped out of my hand to say, you idiot. How could you have done that, you see? And don't those thoughts come in? Let them go. Who's the accuser of the brethren? I tell you, it's the enemy of souls. And yet God has said in everything give thanks. And God has said that he can turn all things out together for good. We have a tendency to go to the negative. Don't, don't take it on. Let it go. Let it go. But if you hold on to it, it'll take root. And notice that science now is proving what Ellen White said in that book, that this grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, invite decay and death into the body. Don't let it come in. Dr. Neil Nedley, in his book, Depression, A Way Out, he states that genetics cannot cause depression. Praise God. 
Do you know what that means? Even if both our parents committed suicide, we need never go there. And some go there because they think they're going to go there. And what does the proverb say? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I said to my daughter when she was 14 that our thoughts and our feelings make up our moral character. And she said, what a worry. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you know the devil can so throw all sorts of things in that brain? And, what, and what's our responsibility? Throw it out. You know, they are saying, when in one ear and out the other, let it. Let it keep going. Don't hold on to it. So genetics cannot cause depression, as we've looked at this week. Genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle calls. Lifestyle pulls the trigger. He also said that, that lifestyle tragedy cannot cause depression. And I'd like to suggest that every heart has its sorrow. Everyone has suffered. Everyone has been through heartache. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. It's what you do with it. So lifestyle tragedy can't cause depression. Sorry, can't blame that. Genetics, sorry, can't blame that. But you know what Neil Ledley shows? You throw this into the equation. You throw the sugar, the wheat, the caffeine, the alcohol. You throw in lack of exercise, lack of oxygen, lack of water, lack of nourishing food, late nights, too much technology. The scales are tipped. Now, we have no say over lifestyle tragedy or genetics, but we have total say over this. So when someone comes to me wanting help with depression, the first thing I do is I get them to drink more water. Mm -hmm. I get them to start easing off their caffeine, <laughs> little by little, so they don't suffer too much and bring on depression. <laughs> I start to get them to eat more nourishing food. I start to get them to limit their technology time, especially when their brain should be sleeping. Mm -hmm. That's where you start. Look at the house. Have you got your, your windows open? I must admit, when it's blowing a gar, my window's only open an inch and a half. See how you've got to put your detective hat on? How did this happen? And when you get all of that in place, frontal lobe starts working better and we can put our detective hat on and find out, now how did this happen? I've seen many conquer their depression by that. Because if the person goes on medication and they're not changing any lifestyle or anything that may have caused it, and then their body gets used to the medication, it's not a pretty story, is it? The end result is not good. So even depression has a cause. And I'd like to go into a little bit more of that now. And we're going to our second point which is the law of choice. This is the second mental law of the mind, is a choice. The Bible says, do unto others as you would have them do to you. I saw a nice little post around here, the golden law. Do you know that's more than a nice, that's more than a nice saying? That law states that whatever you give out, you shall receive again. So be careful what you're giving out. There's a slogan on the back of cars in Australia. It says, parents, be nice to your children. They're going to choose your old folks home. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it is true. It is true. So what happens if someone's been very badly abused? Mm -hmm. Physically, sexually, mentally abused. So what do we do with that? Walk away. How can you walk away? Well, do you know what God says? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And he'll do a better job. Leave it with him. Because if you want to get back at them, what does the law state? It's going to come back on you again. Walk away. How can you walk away? You can walk away through the choice to forgive. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Otherwise, I'd like to suggest that we would never do it. The pain goes too deep and too great. I want to tell you about Doug. Doug did our program. He's 40. He was there for two weeks. He had prostate cancer. I said to Doug, did you have a happy, healthy childhood? He said, no, my father yelled at me all my life. All my life. He just yelled and yelled and yelled. I said, oh, 
Okay. So we moved on. He's frowning. Everyone he talked to, all week, he talked about how his father yelled at him and yelled at him and yelled at him. After he'd heard the lecture on forgiveness, I said, Doug, have you forgiven your father? You don't understand. He yelled at me all my life. So I decided to uh, <coughs> flex the muscles a little here and push the limits a little. I said, Doug, I appreciate it. must have been very, very difficult. What's the first character of God? Mercy. Mercy. I said, I appreciate it. it must have been very hard. But Doug, you've got to forgive. You don't understand. I said, Doug, it'll only take a minute. It's something you've got to do. You've got to do this to let go of it. You don't understand. I decided to move on. Two minutes later, he said, I've done it. It's a good illustration. That's all it is. You don't have to feel like it. How could you? Just do it. I said, congratulations, Doug. And he went, mm. <laughs> Do you know what I noticed in the following week? Doug did not tell the story. You see, forgiveness is the only prescription in the entire universe that has the power to break the chemical bonds of hostility, anger and hate. What keeps most people back is they don't feel like it. One lady said, I thought if I didn't feel like it, I hadn't really done it. I said, no, 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 that's a deception of the devil. You've done it. That's enough. Because the third, the third law of the mind states that your words affect your feelings. Just do it. And you'll feel like it. I can't promise you'll feel like it immediately. But you know, as the days go on, and you confirm in your mind, I have forgiven. Because there are times when you won't feel like it. But remember, your feelings are a bad guide. They go up and down like the wind. Just do it. Just do it. Not negotiable. What did Peter say to Jesus? I think, you know, what if we forgive seven times? Peter thought that was pretty generous. <laughs> what did Jesus say 70 times? Ah. Never ever is the stage when you do not. You just do it. And who's the winner? Do you know who we are? Love is also a choice. I'm sure most people in this room know that Hollywood is wrong. Love is a choice. It is not a feeling. Let me give you a story to illustrate. This happened about 20, a uh, little bit over 20 years ago. I'd been a single mother for four years. My first husband was a drug addict and an alcoholic, and I was forced to leave my home. I was a single mother for four years. And I was working in a health retreat. And the business manager, his name was Michael, and he'd been a single father for a few years. And unbeknownst to me, he'd made a list. He needed a wife, and he thought, I'm going to choose my wife scientifically. Because <laughs> he's a businessman. He said, if it works out on paper, it'll work. He said, my first marriage, it was a feeling thing. Now it's going to be business. <laughs> so he'd made a list of every woman that he knew. Now, Michael and I, we'd known each other for 10 years because our kids were homeschooled. We'd met at homeschool camps. And he'd made a list of all the women that he knew. And uh, one name kept going to the top of the list. I didn't know about the list, but it was me. He said, I had two negatives against my name. One was I had too many children. Who's going to take on six children? Uh, that's a big load. <laughs> and I was older than him by a few years. And he, would, he said he would never have thought of anyone older than him, but he thought, I think he was almost 40 and I was a little more than 40. He thought, what does it matter when you're 40? And as I moved up into the area and he got to know the children, he realised they were very good workers. So he thought, well, that's going to go to the positive list. <laughs> so, so when those two negatives had gone, he realised that apparently my name was the top of the list. So he came into my house one day and he said, I've got a few things to talk to you about. I said, yes. He said, I think, that, um, I think we should get married. <laughs> Just like that. 
I said, this is very analytical. He said, so I'm a very analytical person. I said, well, I think when two people marry, they should love each other. And he went like that, hmm. He said, well, I'm very attracted to you and I love your character. And when he said that, I thought to myself, really? I feel the same about Michael O'Neill. I just thought you couldn't get near him with a 10-foot pole. So I said, all right, I will. Just like that. It, it seems like a very flippant answer to a life-changing question. But you know, when you fall in love, you fall in love with character. Yeah, that's what you fall in love with. And that character, under the hand of God, gets beautiful. Something had happened to me six months previous to this. I was in a meeting and Michael, who'd been a wild bikey in his youth, he became, he made a decision to become a Christian after looking at Daniel chapter 2, the prophecies. He was amazed. So he said, right, I'm going to be a Christian. I don't know whether the church realised what happened because this wild bikey came in the back door with his greasy long hair and his leathers and sat down the front. I thought people were a bit uncomfortable because the big bike was out the front. But he just saw it. You see, this is where God appeals to us. Uh, no, he doesn't have long hair and leathers anymore. He's <laughs> God's been working. <laughs> but I was in a meeting and he was telling how when he became a Christian, he thought, what am I going to do for excitement now? Because he loved the excitement of being a bikey. And then he thought, I'm going to start meetings. And he went to the lower economic area of the town and he made little cards, youth club. And he, anyone between the age of, I think, 8 and 14 could come to his youth club. And it was once a week on a Thursday afternoon for two hours. And he had to stop it at 55 kids. And he taught them how to tie knots. Um, they played games. He read them Bible stories and they sang songs. And you know, when I'm listening to this, a voice came into my head, I want that man. And that shocked me. I thought, you know, aren't you glad people can't read your thoughts? I thought, this is, <laughs> this is terrible. I was very surprised at what my mind had just done. But I was impressed with his action. And you know, he just did it by himself. No, no one else. And six months later, he's in my kitchen asking me to marry. So there's a bit of influence there. He said, great, meet me tonight at my house with all the kids. And he was gone. <laughs> now, the age of the kids were 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 19, 21. Mine 10, he's 11. Mine 12, he's 13. And all the rest mine. So we met at his house that night. They were all in a half circle. And he said, well, children, we've got an announcement to make. And his daughter said, Dad, we already know. <laughs> he said, right, what does everyone think? Do you know, every child agreed. And I thought that was a miracle. Michael showed great respect to my children by the way that he had done it. Because especially me and my little boys, they were my knights in shining armour. You know, they didn't want anyone to come near their mother. So he showed great respect to those children. Anyway... Every child agreed. I thought that was amazing. Michael said, no need to wait, let's get married. But you can't just get married. We had to wait two and a half weeks to get married. <laughs> you see, this is where you fall in love with, and we'd made our decision. Do you know, two days later, when he walked past the window, my heart started to beat, and I thought, what's happening? And I thought, oh, that's right, I'm marrying him. <laughs> You see, your words affect your feelings. And you have to be careful on those words. So when I said yes, I basically made an agreement to love this man. You don't look at someone and say, well, I suppose I should marry them. They're everything. No, no, of course there must be an attraction. And what appealed to me was when he said, I love your character and I'm very attracted to you. And I recognised that I felt the same. <laughs> And that's why I said yes. And we've been married 20 years now. <laughs> Love is a choice. And Michael has never raised his voice to me. He has never got angry with me. Oh, man, that's what women love. <laughs>
And sometimes women say, Barbara, you just wait on this man. You make his breakfast, you iron his clothes. I said, oh, yes, but what he does for me. <laughs> I say, women, you want, you want your husbands to treat you like a king? I mean, treat you like a queen. <laughs> treat them like a king. And some women say, well, I will when he starts treating me like a queen. No, 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 no. Do you know, the Bible says there is that that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. That's Proverbs 12, 18. And do you know what shocks me? That sometimes I hear this piercing of a sword in a home. Ah. And then the phone rings and it's the bank manager. Oh, hello. Ah. Do you know, there's a God in heaven and he writes it all. Is that right? And even when I ran over Michael's computer in the car, it was an accident. <laughs> My name's Bulletergate, I'm afraid. I do something, something's a bit fast and I forgot that the computer was anyway. Do you know what he said to me? He said, he rang up and he said, it's all right. <laughs> oh, how I love that man. Yeah. You see, love suffereth long and is kind. <laughs> love envieth not, love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. What a beautiful illustration of love is in 1 Corinthians 13. Your words affect your feelings. You must be very careful on your words. In fact, no wonder the prophet He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that openeth wide his mouth shall have destruction. And that brings us to the fourth law, is that your words reveal your feelings. And you can't let them all out. Mm -hmm. Oh, how many words have been said that should never have been said. If you're frustrated, go for a run. Mm -hmm. Go and dive in that sea. Come back when frontal lobe is in charge. The Bible says, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That's Colossians 4 verse 6. When someone speaks like the piercings of a sword, do you know who it pierces the most? Themselves. Themselves. Yep. Your words reveal your feelings, and you can't let them all out. Proverbs 29, 11 says, The fool utters all his mind, but the wise man keeps it until afterwards. Number five is the law of adaptation. Did you know that it's only the last 13 years that medicine has acknowledged we have a changeable brain? They call it neuroplasticity. You've heard of it? Or soft wide? They thought our brain was hard wired. But God knew, because in the Proverbs, he told us. So Proverbs 13, verse 20, the Bible says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed because of neuroplasticity. The other proverb is Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways, and get a snare for thy soul because of the law of adaptation. Because of the law of adaptation, our brain has the ability to grow and our brain has the ability to shrink. So let me give you a wonderful growing scenario. Every time we learn something new, we develop another dendrite. So every time I learn a new Bible verse, I'm developing another dendrite, another dendrite. Every time the young man on the piano learns a new piece, another dendrite, another dendrite. Science is showing the three things that can cause us to develop new dendrites is learning a musical instrument, learning a new language, and memorizing the Bible. Mm -hmm. We've got one trillion brain cells. One brain cell has the ability to develop 70,000 dendrites. I can hardly get my mind around that. Where does it all fit? So we should be learning new things right up until the day we die. I think it'll take you, you'll probably be quicker than me at memorizing. It takes me a long time. So the verses that I give to you, this is years and years and years. It's just like learning to play that piano. Do you see what a concert pianist does? He practices for eight hours a day before he presents. 
And if you were to hear him before he started practicing, you'd think he doesn't need to practice. <laughs> he wants it perfect. What sort of service are we giving to God? Is it perfect? No wonder the Bible says in Romans 12 verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. God has given to us. He's done everything. What more could he do? It's time to choose your instrument. Mm -hmm. Spend the rest of the day thinking about your new instrument. Sorry, the triangle's out. You can tr tr try a recorder, <laughs> mouth organ. I tell you, they're not easy. And when you pick it up, you're going to think to yourself, oh, I could never conquer this. Well, you won't. <laughs> but if you say, do you know if I do this every day, you have a look at what happens every day. When children are learning the piano, what are they got to do? Every day, every day. Same with memorising, same with memorising. I go over it and over it and over it and over it. And when I can say it backwards, I'm ready to present it. <laughs> the hardest time is when you're up front. Not backwards word by word, but verse by verse. It's time to start growing. Right up till the day we die, that can happen. What's the terrible growing scenario? When we entertain or cherish negativity, thorns grow. And those thorns can damage the brain cells and those thorns can cause psychosomatic diseases. Let it go. Don't take on, don't take on that negativity. Well, what's the wonderful shrinking scenario? When we forgive, we turn painful past to dust. And when you turn painful past to dust, there's no bad smell to draw you down there anymore. Praise be to God. And the pathway to that painful memory shrinks. Isn't God good? Very good. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she goes one step further. She says that when you forgive everyone who's ever hurt you in your life, misunderstood you, abused you, she said, when you go to sleep tonight, let's say we do it today, everyone who's ever hurt us, tonight when we go to sleep between the hours of 10 and 3, little cells called glial cells are activated. Now these glial cells are more numerous than nerve cells. So when we're sleeping tonight, because we have forgiven, and if you can't, just say, God, give me the ability to forgive them. Practice makes perfect. Those glial cells come along and vacuum clean up all the thorns. Medicine is now showing that forgiveness has a physiological effect. This explains why Doug stopped telling everyone that his father yelled at him all his life. You see that? When he forgave, that night his glial cells cleaned up all the thorns and there was no fresh memory to take him down there anymore. What's the terrible shrinking scenario? If you don't use your brain cells, you will lose them. What does, regard, what does God require of us? Not just maintenance, but development. Yeah? in page 347 of Christ Objects Lesson. The writer states, the transgression of physical law is transgression of the moral law. For God is as truly the author of the physical law as he is of the moral law. He has written his law with his own finger on every nerve, muscle, faculty with which we have been entrusted and every misuse of any part of our organism is a violation of that law. All should become intelligent as to this human frame and how to keep it in the conditions necessary to do the work of the Lord. The relation that exists between the spiritual life and the physical organism is one of the most important branches of education. The physical organism should be carefully preserved and developed. Got that? That through humanity, the divine nature might be revealed in all of its fullness. To who? 
our family, our friends, our relatives, our neighbours, our workmates. Oh, what a high calling is ours. The last law is the law of diversion. And don't you love the law of diversion? What's the old saying? When God closes a, a door, he opens a window. An Italian man said, no, 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 Barbara. In Italy, we say when God closes one door, he opens two. Have you noticed that some of the greatest heartaches in your life have turned out to be some of your greatest blessings? When I drove out of my mountain home after a very scary night when my first husband had got a gun, when I drove out of my mountain home, the only way he'd let me go was he thought I would come back. I had nothing but my children and a change of clothes. I thought it was the worst thing that ever happened in my life. Turned out to be the best. <laughs> Turned out to be the best. Mm -hmm. Because no woman wants to leave her home. Do you know what used to keep me there? Oh, I'm about to pick the lettuces. My roses are about to bloom. Oh. And then it, you, the, the lettuces and the roses <laughs> mean nothing. You're, you're fleeing for your life. But God is so good. He is more important than anything. What does the Bible say in Philippians? Yea, I, I count all things but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that it, which is through the, that is the righteousness of Christ through faith, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain Amen. to the resurrection of the dead. When he is everything to you, he can give you everything. <laughs> That's how it is. Notice this last sentence of the first paragraph. To transgress his law, whether it be physical, mental or moral, is to place oneself out of harmony with the universe, to invite discord, anarchy, and ruin. And lo, I looked, and I beheld a lamb on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their forehead. Where does he want to write it? Right there. And so when Moses said, I beseech you, show me. Your glory. God said, no man can see me and live. I'll pass by before you. And he did. And he proclaimed, merciful, gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Keeping mercy, there it is again, for thousands. Forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Who will in no wise pardon the guilty? Let's go forward to Revelation 20. 20. Uh, I think it's 22 verse 7. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be written in their foreheads. What did he say to Moses? No man can see me and live. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be written in their foreheads. Allow the great God of heaven in. Allow him to write. Let us close. Father in heaven, we praise you and we thank you for this human brain. And we ask your forgiveness, Father, that we have not maintained and developed it as we should. Father, today is the first day of the rest of our life. May we each make a decision today to totally consecrate our frontal lobe to you and to allow you to come in, to allow you to write your name in our foreheads. And as the Bible states, arise and shine for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold, the darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Oh, Father, we look forward to that day. May we each do our part is my prayer in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
my CD for the song. We've been blessed through this seminar. If you've been blessed personally, again, why don't you give God praise? Amen. We'd like to remind you that this afternoon at 5 o'clock, there's a seminar here on the investigative judgment. All are invited to come to that particular seminar. Also on Tuesday evening, at 7 o'clock, there is an evening prayer session that's here. Those who love to rise early in the morning, at 7 o'clock, there's prayer. 6 o'clock, I'm sorry. And at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, there's prayer as well. Many have been asking about the garden class. It's currently going on. started on last Thursday. If you would like to have a special excursion of that class, I was considering on Sunday mornings. If we would consider Sunday mornings, then if there's a showing of at least 30 to 40 people, then we would consider that here uh, beginning on the following week. But that would determine the interest. That all said, friends, let's close our service by using the hymn 108, Amazing Grace. Let us seek the Lord. Loving Father, we are indeed thankful and grateful for your blessings to us this day. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, slipping and stumbling, able to present you faultless before his throne. To the only wise God be glory, dominion, power, both now and forevermore. Let the church say amen and amen. Remember as you're leaving here this evening, this afternoon, if you care to put something, special gift toward those in ministry, serving, please do so. May you be seated until ushered out.
all Southampton ladies. We're asking to be meet on the um, organ side, all Southampton ladies. Thank you. <laughs> 